Carmos was the last king of the Theban 17th dynasty. He was possibly the son of Sikonanra Tau and Arotephi and the full brother of Armos I, founder of the 18th dynasty. His reign fell at the very end of the Second Intermediate Period. Carmos is usually ascribed a reign of three years, although some scholars now favor giving him a longer reign of approximately five years. His reign is important for the decisive military initiatives he took against the Hyksos, who had come to rule much of ancient Egypt. His father had begun the initiatives and, quite possibly, lost his life in battle with them. It is thought that his mother, as regent, continued the campaigns after the death of Carmos and that his full brother made the final conquest of them and united all of Egypt. Campaigns Kajus Beli Carmos was the final king in a succession of native Egyptian kings at Thebes. Originally, the Theban 17th dynasty rulers were at peace with the Hyksos kingdom to their north prior to the reign of Sikonanra Tau. They controlled Upper Egypt up to Elephantine and ruled Middle Egypt as far north as Kusa. Carmos sought to extend his rule northward over all of Lower Egypt. This apparently was met with much opposition by his courtiers. It appears that at some point, these princes in Thebes had achieved a practical modus vivendi with the later Hyksos rulers, which included transit rights through Hyksos-controlled Middle and Lower Egypt and pasturage rights in the Fertile Delta. Carmos's records on the Carnarvon tablet relate the misgivings of this king's council to the prospect of a war against the Hyksos. However, Carmos's presentation here may be propaganda designed to embellish his reputation since his predecessor, Sikonanra Tau, had already been engaged in conflict with the Hyksos only to fall in battle. Carmos sought to regain by force what he thought was his by right, namely the kingship of Lower and Upper Egypt. The king thus responds to his counsel. There is no evidence to support Pierre Montet's assertion that Carmos's move against the Hyksos was sponsored by the priesthood of Amun as an attack against the Seth worshippers in the north. The Carnarvon tablet does state that Carmos went north to attack the Hyksos by the command of Ammon, but this is simple hyperbole, common to virtually all royal inscriptions of Egyptian history, and should not be understood as the specific command from this deity. Carmos states his reasons for an attack on the Hyksos was nationalistic pride. He was also likely merely continuing the aggressive military policies of his immediate predecessor, Sikonanra, who apparently died in battle against the Hyksos. Northern campaign in Carmos's third year, he embarked on his military campaign against the Hyksos by sailing north out of Thebes on the Nile. He first reached Nephrasi, which was just north of Kusa and was manned by an Egyptian garrison loyal to the Hyksos. A detachment of Medje troops attacked the garrison and overran it. The Carnarvon tablet recounted this much of the campaign, but breaks off there. Nonetheless, Carmos's military strategy probably can be inferred. As Carmos moved north, he could easily take small villages and wipe out small Hyksos garrisons, but if a city resisted, he could cut it off from the rest of the Hyksos kingdom simply by taking over the city directly to the north. This kind of tactic probably allowed him to travel very quickly up the Nile. A second stellar also found in Thebes, continues Carmos's narrative again with an attack on Abris. Because it does not mention Memphis or other major cities to the north, it has long been suspected that Carmos never did attack Abris, but instead recorded what he intended to do. Kim Ryholt recently has argued that Carmos probably never advanced farther than the ANPU or Sinopolis Nome in Middle Egypt and did not enter either the Nile Delta, nor Lower Egypt proper. According to the second stellar, after moving north of Nefrasi, Carmos's soldiers captured a courier bearing a message from the Hyksos king Awozer Apapiat Avaris to his ally, the ruler of Kush requesting the latter's urgent support against Carmos. Carmos promptly ordered a detachment of his troops to occupy and destroy the Bahria oasis in the western desert, which controlled the north-south desert route. 
Carmos, called the strong, in this text, ordered this action to protect his rear guard. Carmos then sailed southward, back up the Nile to Thebes, for a joyous victory celebration after his military success against the Hyksos in pushing the boundaries of his kingdom northward from Cusa past. Hermopolis through to Sarko, which now formed the new frontier between 17th dynasty of Thebes and the 15th dynasty Hyksos state. Reihold notes that Carmos never claims, in his second stella to attack anything in avarice itself, only, anything belonging to avarice i.e., the spoil, of war, which his army has carried off, as lines 7 to 8 and 15 of Carmos's stella, the only references to avarice here, demonstrate, line 7 to 8, I placed the brave guard Flatia to patrol as far as the desert edge with the remainder behind it, as if a kite were preying upon the territory of avarice, line 15, I have not overlooked anything belonging to avarice, because it is empty, the second stellar of Carmos is well known for recounting that a Hyksos messenger was captured with a letter from Apophis, appealing for aid from the king of Kush against Carmos, while traveling through the western desert roads to Nubia. The final evidence that this king's military activities affected only the Sinopolite gnome, and not the city of Avarice itself is the fact that when Carmos returned the letter to Apophis, he dispatched it to ATFIH which is about a hundred miles south of Avarice. ATFIH, hence, formed either the new border or a no-man's land between the now-shrunken Hyksos kingdom and Carmos's expanding 17th dynasty state. Furthermore, Carmos states in his second stella that his intention in returning the letter was for the Hyksos messenger to inform Apophis of the Theban king's victories in the area of Sinopolis which used to be in his possession. This information confirms that Carmos confined his activities to this. Egyptian gnomon never approached the city of Avarice itself in his year three. First Nubian campaign Carmos is known to have campaigned against the Kushites prior to his third year since the Hyksos king directly appeals to his Kushite counterpart to attack his Theban rival and avenge the damage which Carmos had inflicted upon both their states. It is unlikely that Carmos had the resources, simultaneously, to defeat the Kushites to the south and then inflict a serious setback on the Hyksos to the north in just one year over a front line that extended over several hundred kilometers length of rain. His year three is the only attested date for Carmos and was once thought to signal the end of his reign. However, it now appears certain that Carmos reigned for one or two more years beyond this date because he initiated a second campaign against the Nubians. Evidence that Carmos had started a first campaign against the Kushites is affirmed by the contents of Apophis' captured letter where the Hyksos King's plea for aid from the King of Kush is recounted in Carmos's Year 3 Second Stella. Two separate rock inscriptions found at Armina and Toshka, deep in Nubia, give the prenomen and nomen of Carmos and Armos side by side and were inscribed at the same time, likely by the same draftsman. According to the epigraphic data, in both inscriptions, the names of Armos follow directly below those of Carmos and each king is given the epithet INH, given life which was normally used only of ruling kings. This indicates that both Carmos and Armos were ruling when the inscription were cut and consequently that they were co-regents. Since Carmos's name was recorded first, he would have been the senior co-regent. However, no mention or reference to Armos as king appears in Carmos's Year 3 Stella which indirectly records Carmos's first campaign against the Nubians. This can only mean that Carmos appointed the young Armos as his junior co-regent sometime after his third year prior to launching a second military campaign against the Nubians. As a result, Carmos's second Nubian campaign must have occurred in his year four or five. The target of Carmos's second Nubian campaign may have been the fortress at Buran which the Nubians had recaptured from Carmos's forces since Estella. 
bearing his car toucher was deliberately erased and there is fire damage in the fort itself. A slightly longer reign of five years for Carmos has now been estimated by Reiholt and this ruler's timeline has been dated from 1554 BC to 1549 BC. To take into account a one-year period of co-regency between Armos and Carmos, Donald Redford notes that Carmos was buried very modestly, in an ungilded stock coffin which lacked even a royal uraeus. This may imply that the king died before he had enough time to complete his burial equipment presumably because he was engaged in warfare with his Kushite and Hyksos neighbors. Mummy The mummy of Carmos is mentioned in the Abbot Papyrus, which records an investigation into tomb robberies during the reign of Ramesses IX, about 400 years after Ramos's interment. While his tomb was mentioned as being in a good state, it is clear that his mummy was moved at some point afterward, as it was discovered in 1857 at Dra Abu El Nagar, seemingly deliberately hidden in a pile of debris. The painted and stuccoed coffin was uncovered by early Egyptologists August Mariette and Heinrich Bruch, who noted that the mummy was in very poor shape. Buried with the mummy was a gold and silver dagger, amulets, a scarab, a bronze mirror, and a pectoral in the shape of a cartoucher bearing the name of his successor and brother, Amos. The coffin remains in Egypt, with the dagger in Brussels and the pectoral and mirror residing the Louvre, Paris. The name of the pharaoh inscribed on the coffin was only recognized for what it was 50 years after the original discovery by which time the mummy, which had been left with the pile of debris on which it was found, was almost certainly long lost. Bibliography Gardner, Sir Allen. Egypt of the Pharaohs. Oxford. University Press, 1964-1961. Montet, Pierre. Eternal Egypt, translated from the French by Doreen Waitman. London, 1964. Pritchard, James B. Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament. Princeton, 1969. Redford, Donald B. History and Chronology of the 18th Dynasty of Egypt. Seven Studies. Toronto, 1967. Reiholt, Kim S. B. The Political Situation in Egypt During the Second Intermediate Period ISBN 87-7289-421-0. Simpson, William Kelly. The Literature of Ancient Egypt. An Anthology of Stories, Instructions, Stelly, Autobiographies, and Poetry. New Haven, 2003, pp. 345-50